your the second thesis of your book, which you state is more controversial, um, really it pushes the envelope um, for scholars in the West to just kind of dismiss miracles out of out of hand, um, and it seems to be pointing to um, a propensity of evidence, um, but yeah, that you've gathered both from the ancient world and from the modern world, and you seem to be suggesting that the propensity of evidence uh, and and the our ability to um, to certain degrees to be able to document it and to show the probability of these things um, should force the question for modern scholars, does the propensity of evidence suggest that miracles are real? Uh, is that kind of where your argument goes in terms of challenging the status quo with scholarship? I think that... I, I don't believe that... Um, well, let me backtrack. Before my conversion, I was an atheist, mm-hmm. and I, I really, I, I have sympathy for people <laughs> who are coming from that position. Right. If you have a worldview where there's there's no possibility that miracles can happen, and you have to explain things in a different way, then you'll come up with a different explanation. And sometimes the explanations look to me to be kind of far-fetched. Sometimes the explanations are simply, well, we don't have a natural explanation now, but sooner or later we will. Um, that's that's kind of admitting that you don't have a, an explanation <laughs> for it. But in any case, um, is, is a Christian, I believe that miracles can happen. Um, but I was... I was uh, talking with one of my professors who, who didn't believe that miracles could happen, and um, he was citing a uh, scholar, a well-known scholar, Rudolf Bultmann. Mm-hmm. And my argument was, you know, Bultmann just assumes that miracles don't happen. He doesn't give any evidence for that position. Mm-hmm. It, when I was an atheist, I didn't believe they could happen. As a Christian, I believe they can happen. But if we want to claim to be neutral, let's look at the evidence. Now, what somebody accepts as proof is going to depend on what standard they hold for proof. There's some people, you know, you give them medical evidence. There's medical evidence from from Lourdes. There's um, an article published in Southern Medical Journal Mm -hmm. uh, in September of 2010 that uh, reports uh, tested changes where where people actually uh, had measurable changes in their eyesight and their hearing significantly. I mean, g- going from being technically blind to being able to see and so on after prayer uh, in Mozambique. I mean, th- there is medical evidence, but then some people will say, okay, well, that's just a little bit of evidence. We need more evidence. <laughs> and right. they keep raising the bar. So, you know, but uh, there are hundreds of millions of people claiming that they have witnessed or experienced healing. Now, you don't have to accept all of that, but to to just dismiss that as evidence, it seems to me, raises the question, what kind of evidence would you be willing to accept? (laughs) How open-minded really are you? How much is enough? (laughs) Yeah, we we, we have, I mean, I think that if somebody was open-minded, I mean, even when I was, looking back on when I was an atheist, uh, once I, once I started, um, considering about, well, how, how do I know for sure that that's, my atheism is correct? If somebody had given me this evidence, I would have been persuaded. Mm-hmm. I, I think there's just a, an enormous amount of evidence. Uh, and for myself, certainly, I interviewed many of these people. Um, I Many of these people are people who are known to me or are are very close to members of my family, or are members of my family, or in one case, are me. Right. <laughs> I, I witnessed a few things myself. Your work is interesting in that it, it reaches beyond, uh, it certainly deals with biblical scholarship, uh, and even philosophy and historiography, um, but it also reaches beyond those disciplines and directly into um, the everyday lives and beliefs of Christians. Um, this obviously belief in miracles or the possibility of miracles is something that affects people um, in the in their day to day lives. Um, is this is this a topic that you think um, or that you believe the church should be actively uh, inquiring about? 
Um, and what role do you think um, this two-volume work on miracles can play in the life of churches, um, especially churches that are seeking, um, not necessarily seeking to have miracles happen, but seeking to understand and wrestle with the possibility of miracles? One thing that the research did for me was it opened my mind up to just the reality of how, how big God is. I I had gotten into the habit just from just from the way I, I was trying to do scholarship within a certain epistemological framework. I got into the habit of asking, uh, well, not asking certain kinds of questions mm -hmm. and almost acting like, well, only the things that can happen humanly are things that we're allowed to really talk about. But, I mean, the Bible is full of the activity of God, and once I, once I was confronted afresh with the fact that, that God can do anything, mm -hmm. I realized, I mean, officially I believed that, but yeah. I realized on a deeper level, wow, I mean, our whole life is supposed to be what you might call supernatural, that is, our whole life should be infused by the Spirit. Paul talks about walking by the Spirit. He talks about the fruit of the Spirit, which is to say, I mean, we don't call these things miracles, but even even the way we live in our daily lives, the way we treat others, is to, is to be dependent on God's power at work in us. So that um, the subject of miracles has an impact even beyond the immediate question of miracles in a culture where we bought into Hume's ideas so much that I think some of us walk around thinking, well, I I believe in God, but God never does anything that couldn't happen on its own anyway. And yeah. um, it's almost I mean, the uh, uh, functionally acting like atheists, even though we claim to be Christians. Yeah, or yeah. or at least deists. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, some 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 Western Christians have complained about. <clears throat> syncretism mm -hmm. in some other parts of the world, and there is such a thing. <laughs> but sometimes in the West, I think we've committed syncretism with deism. Mm. We we have we've knocked God down to a size that is more believable to us without having to challenge the values of our culture. Yeah, it's and it's really in, in many ways. I mean, it's kind of the the Enlightenment project ultimately, in many ways, elevates the human mind and allows the human mind to determine what reality is rather than allowing God to reveal to us what true reality is. Yeah, yeah. It, now, I, I don't want to sound like I'm against everything in the Enlightenment. Oh, I mean, no. Obviously, yeah. I'm a scholar. I, I use a, a lot of uh, tools that we've learned from the Enlightenment. But Actually, the, again, the early Enlightenment wasn't anti-Christian. Well, at least in England, it wasn't right. anti-Christian. Right. It was um, certain certain ideas that became part of the Enlightenment. And I think in uh, in today's world, where we're listening to other cultures, and um, I think we can learn to listen to the biblical texts in a way that comes closer to the way the first Christians would have heard them. I mean, in, in the first century, if, if a Greek went into a temple of Asclepius, and there are these uh, testimonies posted in the wall, or these um, uh, models of uh, body parts that were healed on, on the wall of a temple of Asclepius, right. they weren't there just so people could say, oh, uh, this is something that happened in the past, very interesting. They were there to encourage people to trust the deity Asclepius to heal them. Right. But when we when we read the accounts of miracles in the Bible, sometimes we gloss over them, sometimes we uh, allegorize them, although, I mean, I think there is some symbolic import, but, but sometimes we allegorize them, sometimes we, um, we are embarrassed by them right. in, in our culture. In some other cultures, when people read those, they they look to a God 
who cares about them in the midst of their suffering, who cares about what they're going through, and they, they look to, to God to help them. And I think that maybe the way they're listening to the text is closer to the way the writers of the biblical text expected their first audiences to read those texts or hear those texts. Mm. Um, one of the one of the chief um, elements that your your work depends on, especially in terms of modern miracles, is the veracity of um, eyewitness accounts. Um, yes. How do you go about um, documenting and then substantiating to the degree that it's possible eyewitness accounts of miracles? Um, obviously, they can't ever be proven, I guess, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, right. But you believe that they can be. Um, verifiable uh, to a certain extent. Can you explain to us how that works? Yes. Um, I mean, ideally, you want to get medical documentation where that's possible. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, I mean, you can't say because the person can't get medical documentation, nothing happened. Right. Because, I mean, well, for one thing, <laughs> we wouldn't be able to work with any of the New Testament accounts because they didn't have medical documentation in any of them. <laughs> but you also can't do that in places where people didn't have um, doctors available. I mean, that's one reason that they're praying to God to heal them. I mean, if they had doctors, you know, it's like if you have a job, you can you can earn money, you can pray for your daily bread, but you also go out and work. If you have a doctor, God's provided medical help. There's nothing wrong with using medical help. That's God's provision for us. But in many of these places, people didn't have medical help. Right. and and there's no way to verify medically what happened. But if a doctor told me that he saw cataracts disappear from somebody's eyes, I would, I would say, well, you know, maybe we didn't have uh, the, the test beforehand or the photograph beforehand, but, you know, I would probably trust the doctor in saying that. If somebody else who's not a doctor tells me they saw cataracts disappearing from somebody's eyes, I mean, now, for some things, you need a medical degree to be able to ascertain whether something happened or not. Right. But if you see cataracts disappear from somebody's eyes and the person starts walking around, I can see, I can see, um, I, I'm not sure you actually need to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think most doctors would say you need to be a doctor <laughs> to be able to recognize that if something like that happens in front of you, that's not a normal situation. Normally, cataracts can be removed only surgically. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's cataract... And, and, I, and I had eyewitness cases with multiple witnesses attesting in some majority world contexts the instant disappearance of cataracts. Mm. And, and, and a variety of other things as well. Sure. Um, so those kinds of events... I mean, headaches disappearing... People can explain psychosomatically, and I mean, God can work through psychosomatic causes. It's not saying it's not God, but uh, but when you have something like that, to say that it was mind over matter takes as much faith as to say that God did it. Right. 